Hi, this is Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A podcast. We're taking a break for Memorial Day and thought we'd use this opportunity to share an episode of our Book Notes Plus podcast, where you'll meet Dr. Mark Vonnegut on his book, The Heart of Caring. Book Notes Plus is hosted by C-SPAN's Brian Lamb and offers a mix of interviews with authors and historians, along with some old favorites from the archives of Brian's long-running TV series, Book Notes. In the dedication of his book, The Heart of Caring, Dr. Mark Vonnegut tells his patients, teachers, and parents everywhere, thank you for letting me have such a good time when I go to work. Dr. Vonnegut is a pediatrician who graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1979. This was after he had been diagnosed at age 25 with severe schizophrenia. He has had four psychotic breakdowns in his life, but has managed to successfully practice pediatrics for close to 40 years. Mark Vonnegut, whose parents named him after another Mark with the last name Twain, writes in his newest book about patients, parents, and insurance companies. Dr. Mark Vonnegut, where did you grow up? I grew up on mostly on Cape Cod in Barnstable Village. And what was it like? <laughs> to me, it was like, it, it, you know, it was like heaven. There, It was Cape Cod without uh, much traffic. I could go uh, wandering in the woods and uh, out on the harbor to catch fish. And um, it, it, was, it was a wonderful place to grow up. We know from your book, among other things, that you're a musician. What was your high school like? High school um, was it was good. The thing that uh, I've loved most about music is from junior high on, I've always had a rock and roll band. And I, I still play with some of the people I played with uh, 40 years ago. I know you named it Septic, septic Shock. What kind yep. of <laughs> shock did you get back for that name? <laughs> There, there were some attendings who were unhappy with it and who, who said, don't you know there are people in this hospital uh, with septic shock? And I said, I know it full well. Um, but, and he said, well, how do you think this makes them feel? I said, well, if they're in the, if they're in the hospital, I think they have other concerns, and, uh, and, and they'll let the name of the rock and roll band slide. Where are you today? I am in, at my, in the parking lot of my practice in Quincy, Mass. And what is your practice today? It's um, it's a it's it has grown from a very small practice to taking care of about five thousand kids. Um, I have four or five uh, doctors, about three or four nurse practitioners, uh, five social workers who uh, who also who do therapy and try to find kids. Uh, resources, and so we've we've kind of grown from uh, pediatrics being a matter of coughs and colds and ear infections to a um, pretty wide range of of uh, services. I never thought I would be uh, giving you know taking care of kids with depression, anxiety, um, and prescribing some of the medicines we prescribe now. Why did you go to Swarthmore College? Because because my mother went there, and, and the alternative w- was becoming a jungle fighter in Vietnam. How old are you today? I am 74 years old, and I don't quite believe it. And why are you still working? Because I love it, and I'm devoted to it, and I want to, well, I want to fight for... Uh, my patients, uh, doctors, um, I don't think people are going to have the same wonderful opportunities I've had to be in the same community for 40 years and be taking care of patients over that long a span. And that lets me, uh, you know, it, it, it's just much, much more rewarding than having a 10-minute visit with somebody who's never seen you and you'll never see them again. You've done three books, written three books. The first one was the Eden Express, 1975. What was the book about? Why did you write it? That was about the late 60s and uh, and early 70s. 
uh, at a time when uh, I think our parents and our teachers uh, thought the world was coming to an end uh, because of the war. Uh, and uh, we went out to British Columbia and started a self-sufficient commune, which now seems um, a little bit crazy to me, but at the time it I, it was a rational choice for myself and a fair number of other people. And when the world didn't end, we were all left with the problem of being in our mid twenties without jobs. Where did you get the name, the Eden Express? It just, it just sort of came to me that that's what we were trying to do. I think there was an optimism and an energy that, um, that, you know, we we had a list. Uh, we're going to get rid of the war, poverty, racism, and I forget what else. Um, but there, but and it, it just felt like when I was leaving uh, my job in the East Coast behind, we were. It was like being on a very powerful train, which was uh, which was leading us to, to some kind of Eden. When did you know that you were sick? I knew I was sick when I ended up in the hospital. And this was, um, the nice thing about that is in those days, doctors decided how long you stayed in the hospital. And my hospitalization uh, was not ideal, but I was there for about four months, and doctors and nurses spent a lot of time with me, teaching me that I had an illness and how to take care of it. What year was that? And what was your sign that you had to go to the hospital? Um, it was 1972. Um, I was hearing voices. I stopped eating or sleeping. I lost 25 pounds. My friends couldn't uh, contain me. I think the final step for them was when I took a big rock and, and threw it through an 8 by 12 picture window because I didn't think there was enough oxygen in the room. So even my even my devoted, um, you know, left wing friends uh, felt that this was something they couldn't really handle, uh, you know, on their own. What were your thoughts when this started to happen? I thought at first that uh, I was achieving some kind of enlightenment. I thought that God was speaking to me directly. Um, and uh, on the one hand, I thought this could be crazy. I said, but if it's not crazy, uh, it's an option I have to cover um, because if 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 this really is enlightenment or whatever, I ha- it's a path I have to follow. And also, it had such momentum that I didn't think I... I I I couldn't have stopped it if I wanted to. Why did you need four months in the hospital, and where was it? It was in British Columbia. It was in New Westminster. Um, It was on Fifth Avenue, um, and it was called Hollywood Hospital. So I took all of those details, and I said, oh, how how can that be? Uh, I I think I was four months in the hospital because it took me uh, that long. They didn't have the as good a medicine medicines as they had now and um it was just sort of you know much more routine for people to stay in hospitals until the doctors were pretty sure they would not relapse i think today patients uh stay the two weeks allotted by their insurance company and then are probably uh heavily medicated often a little more heavily medicated than uh, than they should be uh because that's a good way to prevent relapse, but it's also a good way to inhibit recovery from mental illness. I know you talk a lot about this in your other books and also in your public appearances, but what were you diagnosed with first and what do you have now? (laughs) I was first diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, And then I think that's because I was so... I was so sick. I also looked like an Old Testament prophet with hair halfway down my back and a full beard. Um, so, um, you know, they when back then it seemed to me when they didn't think you were going to go do very well, you were diagnosed as schizophrenic. As I got better, 
Um, then I was I was promoted to being a schizophrenic who might respond well to lithium. And when I responded well to lithium, uh, I went to UMass Boston and found that I could do math and science again. Um, and uh, then I had a great argument with the Harvard Admissions Committee. Um, who the the discussion was what was my diagnosis, and I think from a practical point of view, as long as you're getting good care, the exact name doesn't matter. But they said um, you are not schizophrenic, and I said okay. And and I and the, their argument was. If you were schizophrenic, you couldn't get into medical school, and we're going to let you into medical school. Therefore, you're not schizophrenic. I, I had enough sense not to argue with their logic. <laughs> what does it mean to be schizophrenic? I think it's, it, it's a more chronic kind of illness, and it's more difficult to recover from. Um, and, you know, being promoted now, I'm, I'm bipolar, formerly manic depressive. Um, it, it, in my case, I've had the good luck to have good care, uh, good support, and I have been able to have a career in medicine. I, you know, I have three very handsome sons. I, you know, I have had a life. Um, schizophrenia is much more of a chronic illness where it's very, very difficult uh, for people to um, take good care of themselves. Um, I mean, it, cer it certainly happens. There are wonderful full recoveries from schizophrenia, but then you have to wonder because there's not a blood test, um, you have to sort of say, uh, and looking back at the history, uh, well, who, does, who really has what? Do they really know what they're talking about? You say uh, that you've had four different psychotic breakdowns yep what years there were uh two in 72 um and there was one in 80 uh 85 uh and i i, I most recently had one uh three years ago which was thankfully briefer and less severe um but, but so that's 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 the four i had I, I ask you this because you are so forthcoming in your books. Uh, and, and can you tell us what kind of medicine you take today? Yeah, I take um, mood stabilizers. I think the most effective one is lithium. Uh, it has some uh, side effects. And I did, took it and helped me for many years, but I'm now switched over to another mood stabilizer. Um, and those are the mainstays of dealing with... Um, you know, with manic depression and preventing psychotic breaks. Um, and there are also newer atypical antipsychotics, which I don't think work as well, but they're, um, they're a big profit item for pharmaceutical companies and they're very heavily promoted. Um, but so, but the medica the medications I'm taking are basically the mood stabilizer, and that's what I've been taking in one form of, of or another for the last uh, you know fifty years. Can you remember the first time you said I want to go to med school? <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of can. It was um, it was I it, when I was recovering from the illness, I had no idea. What, what kind of capabilities were going to come back? So I went to a friend and uh, who, uh, old time friend, and and I asked him if I could uh, do landscaping. It turned out I could do landscaping, and then I wondered, okay, can the brain's working well enough? I wonder if I can do substitute teaching at Barnstable High, and it turned out I could do that. And then um, I said, well, what would I have been? What would I have done if it hadn't been for the '60s and all that turmoil and uh, everything? And uh, I said, well, I was I was good at chess. I was good at math. I love science, so I should have been a doctor. And I said, oh, but unfortunately, you're too old. And you know, to think of yourself as too old for anything when you're 25 is a little odd to me now. Uh, but I went back to UMass Boston, and surprise, surprise, I, you know, I, I could do well. Um, and I published a few articles, uh, mostly about mental illness. And then uh, I applied to 20 medical schools, and uh, one accepted me. One out of 20, and it was Harvard? Yep. 
<laughs> it's it's you know you can't write this stuff. That's why that, that's why I don't write fiction. It's not as interesting. <laughs> why? Why? Oh, interesting. Why Harvard Medical School, and why did they accept you? I think they accepted me because I wrote well, um, and I, I think they sensed. Uh, uh, that I was partially to, you know, prove to myself in the world that I was not damaged goods. I had a um, strong work ethic and a, and a desire to be of service. And, uh, and as I say, I wrote well enough to get published. And, uh, and they were at that point looking for more variety than just straight A kids. And I was variety. What year did you graduate from med school, and why did you choose pediatrics? I graduated in 1979, um, and in medical school, you get a chance to, um, you know, you're a surgeon for a month, you do dermatology, you do pediatrics, you can do pediatric ICU. I just like working with kids and their resilience and their, um, they they wanted to, and and they and and they often got better. Uh, so, and I like pediatricians. They seem, you know, they seem to have the same sense of humor and hope that I did. In about 2010, 2011, you wrote, "Just like someone without mental illness, only more so." A memoir. What did you want right. to accomplish with that book, and what did you put in it? I wanted to um, sort prove. Uh, to uh, my profession and people in general that severe mental illness and hospitalizations uh, did not foreclose the possibility of a good and rich life. Um, I think a lot of people who have been through what I've been through, um, they clean up pretty well and they, um, you know, they can they can pass for normal and they do. I can, <laughs> uh, and but I did at some point in my illness it became important to me to um, to you know not to always tell the truth uh, about my illness. You tell a story about your wife putting one of your books out on the table <laughs> in the, in the reception room and. <laughs> What, what? Why did she do that? And what was your reaction when you found out? Well, she's a nice wife, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and she was just proud. And she didn't realize, as I explained later, that I have a boundary here. I do. I want to keep my professional life and my writing life. And I was afraid, like most actors are, that the patients will find out that they have human flaws. Um, and um, but the, but the the result was um, you know patients care about their own illnesses and concerns and the first patient came back and she said to me in a Dorchester accent uh, Dr Vonnegut I didn't know you had mental illness and then and I said well how is Travis doing I said oh Travis is you know it was, but there was not a skipped beat so I've also um, you know spoken at medical schools and. Then, I wrote an article for JAMA about recovery and service, just sort of um, you know trying to put mental illness in perspective and trying to give people a more optimistic uh, outlook and uh, a willingness to devote um, resources to helping people with mental illness. It's not often that you can ask a doctor this kind of a question, and I don't think I've ever asked a doctor this. Um, <clears throat> this question will be represented by lots of people behind me. When you, when a doctor puts you in a room, I, I hope I don't raise my voice on this. You put you in a room, <laughs> shuts the door and says, or the nurse does and says, the doctor will be, will be right with you. And maybe 45 minutes later, the doctor shows up. There's never much of an apology. You're sitting in a room that doesn't have any magazines in it. And if you haven't come prepared, you're looking at the wall. Look, I've seen this all my life. Tell me why this happens. It's unconscionable. And it, it, uh, and it didn't used to be that way 40 or 50 years ago. 
Um, and today, in reaction to that, because I think that's symbolic of, of what's gone wrong with our medical care, why we're paying uh, so much for so little, is that um, doctors are now, we have huge overheads and computers, and we're required to clickety-clack or, or dictate almost as we're taking care of somebody. So the net amount of, of uh, eye contact and real communication with patients and doctors now is sort of um, less than 10 minutes. 40% of most encounters, the doctor is uh, working on a computer screen and, uh, and, and just sort of in passing listening to the patient. And, and that slows down everything. Um, when... Nurses took care of nurses and doctors took care of doctoring. They had control of the system and they didn't have to do uh, all of the extraneous things. Uh, I mean, we send people to medical school. We should let them use what they learn there. Let me ask you about three of your very favorite things. Copays, deductibles, <laughs> deductibles, and insurance companies. Here's the thing. People think that, um, I mean, there is a sameness uh, and to the history. And part of what I try to do in the new book is to show uh, with the patient vignettes how, you know, uh, a girl comes from Cape Verde with a note pinned to her chest saying, I have cancer, and her going to Mass General and being taken care of essentially for free um, to a world where I had to write notes that says, Maggie, still has no left leg, uh, you know, um, and, you know, this kid still needs a wheelchair. Um, so that's a huge amount of money and effort that goes into uh, essentially making medical care much more expensive. And, and now I got into one of, one of my rants, and I'm not even sure what, oh, <laughs> what you asked me in the first place. Copays, deductibles, and insurance uh, companies. They're all the same. And, you know, we have come to a consensus that not paying for people with uh, pre-existing conditions uh, is not good. But when you look at mathematically at co-payments and deductibles and prior authorizations and a bunch of other stuff, they're all the same in the patients pay more and get less. Um, and it's just done by di by different names. I mean, insurance companies now they know exactly what medications you took. You know what that your medical um, you know expenses were last year. Uh, if somebody comes to me as an employer and says, "Well, you have an asthmatic, you have a diabetic, you have somebody who's over sixty working," they customize those rates in such a way as they're essentially not there are making care of people with serious medical illnesses more expensive uh, for the doctors and hospitals who are taking care of these people. You watch television at night, as you well know, or if, probably in the daytime, <laughs> and you see, as you say, $6.5 billion in television ads from pharmaceuticals telling us about mystery drugs. Right. And... I, in a compulsive way, have my iPhone, and I will look up what this new Zimmy Zammy Wuchaha uh, costs, and very few of those drugs that are advertised are less than $50,000 a year. Um, and yes, they can bring some relief to people with these conditions, but it's usually, the, you know, it's the, the co-payments, and there are all these things that really act as toll bridges so the many, many patients who could benefit from that drug can't get it because they are their insurance company. Uh, they, they, it's just made unaffordable. But still, the patient will come in um, to, to a doctor's office and say, I need the purple pill. They don't know what the purple pill is or what it does, but they've been scammed essentially into thinking that they need these very expensive uh, medicines, which the industry itself calls blockbuster medicines, and what they are is budget buster medicines. Why do they tell you in those ads, and every single one of them does it, that uh, there are side effects, your arm can drop off, your ear can go away? <laughs> you know, you go down the list and you just sit there and you go, really? You spend 30 seconds telling me that. Uh, why do they have to do that? 
And our the, other, other way to ask is why do they get away with it? The, but, but both things are uh, mandated by the FDA. Um, so, but you notice the tone of voice is quite different when they're telling you that this thing <laughs> might kill you or your left arm will fall off. Um, but they they are not allowed to advertise to the public without giving those warnings. Uh, and this kind of advertising is not uh, allowed in Europe or Japan or any other because of how much it adds to the cost of medical care and it's and and because it distorts medical care uh and it leads to over prescriptions um and and all sorts of things but the th- those warnings are they're legally mandated to put those in there but as you notice the tone of voice is quite a bit different and you're left with this uh beautiful picture of boys and girls on beaches uh, uh who no longer have to worry about their psoriasis you tell us that today it takes six months to get a psychiatrist appointment? Yes. Um, and, uh, again, that is unnecessary. When I, you know, 40 years ago, when I had a kid who was cutting themselves or doing something like that, uh, I didn't expect, nobody expected me to be an expert in that. And I would call up the head of psychiatry at Mass General and say, Hey, Mike, please come. I want you to see this kid. And usually, uh, and with other referrals, they were done not through an electronic medical record. It was a phone call from one doctor to another. Please take care of this kid. What's going on? That kid was usually seen within a week and given good care. Um, And it's you have to be um, psychiatrically so sick that you try to kill yourself. You go to an emergency room. They declare you're not a danger to yourself and others and send you home. Um, Or you, if you are a danger um, to yourself and others, to your family, um, you stay five to six days in the emergency room because they say there are no beds in the psychiatric hospitals. And during their stay in the emergency room, they, if they're lucky, see a psychiatrist once who declares whether or not they're a danger to themselves or others. Nobody talks about the need to treat uh, anxiety, suicidal thinking, all these other things. It's just this end point of you are not a danger, um, you know, go home. What, what's the story about Coach Smith? <laughs> he's, he's one of the most colorful people in the world, um, and he's been a friend since elementary school. Um, and he got this very rare, um, um, you know, kidney disease, which was happily, uh, one that mostly happens to kids. So I happen to know some about it. And he went to a nephrologist and they treated him with steroids, which is the right thing to do, but he didn't get better. So, or he relapsed and they treated him with more steroids and more steroids and more steroids, um, until he, you know, he, he was a water balloon. He he weighed about 250 pounds. Um, this is a former professional athlete, uh, a combat veteran from Vietnam. I mean, he, you know, we owed him good care. And, uh, I knew that, you know, because of kids, when they relapse, you give them a different medication. Uh, but his, His doctor was certainly content to just push the same button because she got paid the same money, uh, probably more because she got to see him more, um, by just going steroids, 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 and got him um, to to Mass General, which is a wonderful hospital, nephrologist, gave him the right medicines. He got better. Um, uh, About a year later, he got an even rarer kind of, of, of of. of acquired hemophilia and um and this had to be treated again with these medications which which are excellent medicines but at the end of the hospitalization he told me that his bill was you know, it was in there for two weeks with these fancy meds he said his bill was over a million dollars he does tend to exaggerate but uh but in any event, um, you know, you and I and, uh, and and Medicare and everybody paid that million dollars. 
your book have, has the most number of chapters I've ever seen with the least number of pages. <laughs> 61 chapters, 238 pages. What was your thought in keeping these chapters so short? Uh, that I could beat my father. <laughs> what do you mean by that? He he sort of taught taught the world and me how to write short, direct sentences and chapters. And if you... <laughs> um, so, uh, and it, it was also, uh, I wanted to include, um, you know, the stories that have been important to me um, and that showed, um, you know, what medical care uh, used to be like and what it still could be like and how a small practice like ours can fight for the right for doctors to control medical care. What were your mother and father like? They, they were very interesting people. Um, <laughs> uh, my father uh, definitely suffered from PTSD. Uh, he was at the Dresden when it was bombed flat, and he was recaptured by the Germans and forced to go into the bomb shelters and retrieve the corpses um, at the age of probably 22. Um, and I think that he became a writer uh, as a way uh, to deal with those issues. He was telling his own story, and I think a lot of great art like his is uh, is people fighting their own mental illness, um, and, and they do it by making themselves and other people less lonely. What was your mother like? She was a very, 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 very smart, very sweet woman who was utterly devoted to my father's success uh and she was also um she was fourth more phi beta kappa and she introduced my father to russian uh novels and she was um um i mean she was sort of indescribable in the way she became essentially uh the mother to to uh most of barnstable village and uh, we actually took in four first cousins when their parents died. And she was like Aunt Jane to the world. <laughs> and, uh, um, but she, and she was very helpful. She also suffers from, suffered from bipolar disease, but she was so smart and charming, nobody ever hospitalized her. But when I was in the hospital and feeling very, very lost and alone, I said, Ha, the voices are so mean. And she says, why don't you just go along with them? That's what I do. And um, um, and then I said, but I can see the future, and it's scary. She says, who, who can't see the future? Everybody can see the future. So that was helpful to me. <laughs> but she was, a, she was a remarkable woman. Did your parents divorce, and if they did, what year? They divorced. Well, the breakup came uh, shortly after Slaughterhouse Five, um, which in many is a wonderful book, but in many ways for our family it was a disaster. Gave us too much money, too much fame, and um, anyway, um, they. I, I don't. I don't actually remember when they officially divorced. That was something they said they didn't do. They didn't want to do. They didn't need to do. Uh, I was probably like 10 years after they broke up. I, I don't know that I got this right, but I'm old enough to remember this name. But is it true that she married Adam Yarmolinsky? Yes. Who was a famous Kennedy aide, Jack Kennedy aide. Yes, he was. And he was actually in charge of segregating, of, uh, of integrating uh, the armed services at the end of World War II. Uh, which was a job uh, that uh, Long needed doing. And she died of what at age 64? She died of ovarian cancer. And one of the last things she said to me is she says, I know they mean well, but it feels like the doctors are holding me by the feet and shaking me upside down to make sure they get every last bit of money. How close are you to the other six siblings in your family today? Um, certainly in, in, you know, in, in touch with them, some more than others, uh, one sister and three of the first cousins we took in, uh, all live out in Western Mass. And that's, that's, the, you know, that's easy to get to. 
Um, and so I try and I try, I have a, 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 a 19 year old who I call my refresher course, but you know, I, <laughs> I, I want him to, you know, stay in touch with those people and family. Where did you meet your wife? I met my wife uh, at a hospital function. Um, I think it was a Christmas party, and uh, we were the only ones uh, who weren't drinking and were sort of introverts, and so we started talking. And when did you get married? (laughs) (laughs) uh, Well, it it took a while, um, and she she didn't think, my proposal was very romantic. I, um, I said, do you want to get married or what? And I think it was the or what that sealed the deal. <laughs> How old are your three children, three boys? I have a 44-year-old, um, a 41-year-old, and a 19-year-old. All from the wife you're married to now? No. You had a no, first one. I had a, a first marriage that... Um, that didn't that just plain didn't work and what year did you get divorced got divorced in uh, let me see about 1990 back to the book who was dr dan <laughs> dr dan was one of the best clinicians i ever met and he was there is a certain focus that a good doctor can bring um, to a patient and their problems. And Dr. Dan was also such a character that he rode his bike in shorts, um, you know, it, well into December. And uh, when he was in the emergency room, he often wore uh, a beanie with a propeller on top. But there was something about how good a doctor he was. He was also a primary care doctor and had his own practice uh, that people forgave or maybe didn't even notice uh, that he had a beanie with a propeller on it. He was that good a doctor. What's your approach? Do you, do you see patients today? I do. I'm, I, I have a way cut back schedule. Um, it's nice to be the boss. I take the uh, first week of every month off. Uh, but I'm I'm always backing up and available, and uh, at the, at the moment try, trying to get some of the younger doctors interesting and interested in running the practice. But they say, "Oh no, you're a good boss. We like you being the boss." So, what is your own personal approach to a patient? Uh, to walk into the room and say, "How can I help you?" and mean it and not have a lot of distractions. And part of a lot of distractions means having three patients in rooms that I have to go bing, bing, bing. I try very hard to not have patients wait. I schedule plenty of time. I do not keep an iPad or a computer in the room. uh, And I try to figure out what, if anything, can be done to help this person. Why do you say your favorite patients are autistic kids? Be, because they're so unguarded and um and and because it's so unpredictable and there's such a wide range of 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 kids you would not believe um the problems that uh some of the older autistic kids come up with and um autism the way it used to be uh diagnosed were kids who had no real language and um a lot of the kids who are autistic um if they have language and a lot of them do they can grow into remarkable people what's happened though over the years with autism and the prognosis and then the prescriptions or whatever you want to say about a doctor's orders once they talk to a, a child with autism it's um see that's it, it becomes a negotiating uh uh thing you ha you have to uh figure out something they want and uh, say um you know I, I, i'm shameless uh if i have uh, a kid who who was terrified of shots i say okay i will not I'll, I'll bargain here you know you don't have to get your flu shot but you do have to clean up your diet stop swearing at your mother or whatever um and autistic kids are often eager to um engage in 
in um, negotiations and and things like that. And when they're really young, they often won't look at you. But as, as they get older, you see uh, them sort of peeking at you and wondering what you might be good for. What would you say, and I have a friend that's done this, what would you say um, to someone that says, I have an autistic child, I've spent $100,000 on this child, and uh, this person's gotten worse? Yeah, and and that's part of, uh, of the problem, is the insurers will uh, undercut uh, the most effective treatments um, because they say it costs too much. Like they say that ABA, which is a applied behavioral analysis, where it's often in-home therapy, and they'll take something like that and put too much high, high, any, anyway, um, kids don't often get the individualized uh, therapy they need, which because of their social limitations is face to face. Nothing else works has to be face-to-face with an autistic kid. Who was Adeline? <laughs> Adeline was, you know, taught me more about pediatrics than any other patient. She was uh, born with these multiple problems, uh, which, uh, um, and she was said, because of her illness, to have a life expectancy of about six months. And then we said, okay, well, she, She's all backed up. Do we do a colostomy? And I said, well, we'll make it more comfortable. You know, the first inclination when you have a horrible diagnosis like that is say, well, let's not do much. Let's not do any harm. Let's not cause pain. But then as time went on and um, and she continued, you know, to be alive, uh, um, oh, she has cataracts. And I, I normally would have said, oh. You know, I'm sorry, she can't see, but we don't know if she could see anyway. We fixed the cataracts. We fixed her hearing. Um, she was playing out in the in the dirt with her uh, siblings, and I had initially said, uh, we, we don't need to vaccinate her. She's, you know, she's going to have a short life. Why give her more pain? Um, she's out playing in the dirt with her siblings. Okay, let's immunize her. And the whole process went that way with me being wrong about one thing other than another after another. But the one thing was the parents knew. Um, for one thing, one of the things I say to patients who are so-called interesting patients, you are the parents. You get to say what happens here. Uh, and the, the parents knew that I wasn't you know, I would never give up on them. And um, and then my wife and I went to Adeline's 16th birthday uh, where she was, you know, um, w- there were pony rides and everything. And that was certainly to uh, be dealing with a kid uh, with that bad a prognosis who was getting value out of life. Uh, the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, took the whole family to Disneyland. Um, so, I mean... Who would have guessed? So I learned much more for, from Adeline than uh, than anybody I ever took care of. What did and she, she act- died at the age of about twenty three? What did she actually have? And is is this the uh, the patient that couldn't see or hear? Yeah, she um, she had trisomy uh, thirteen, uh, which she described as Down syndrome, only much much worse. Uh, and that they have some of the same um, uh, congenital defects. But usually they have heart disease um, such that, um, that that they don't live very long. But she had heart disease, but it was structured in such a way uh, that it worked well enough to keep her alive. You say in 1979 that a hospital room would cost $100 a day, and in 2022, four thousand a day (laughs) yeah and um and uh guess what um 50 years ago uh an average household spent two hundred dollars on health care that's prescriptions nursing homes doctors nurses hospitals that was the average um medical burden uh financial burden on most house households was two hundred dollars it's now over twenty thousand uh we are spending uh twice as much on as any other country we are spending four trillion dollars 
Uh, and that's a lot of dollars. I mean, I don't know what $4 trillion would weigh, but um, anyway, we're paying $4 trillion for not very good health care. And that's something I would think that we could build a consensus on that, you know, whether, you know, it's easy to polarize people, uh, but to say this spending $4 trillion is not doing us much good is a problem. You know, it's a problem, red, white, blue, left, right, whatever. What's your um, reaction when you read about an insurance company CEO that makes between 20 and $50 million a year? I, 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 I foam at the mouth and steam comes out of my ears. Why? <laughs> because it's just so outrageous. Um, uh, you know, it, the, the part of what I'm telling in my book is sort of the history of how for-profit uh, entities um, like the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry, how they were supposed to make care more affordable and how they, in fact, made it worse. Uh, and patients pay for everything. And so they're paying that $50 million. And they're paying, um, you know, they're paying for all these outrageous things at the same time that diabetics can't afford insulin and uh, people who need care can't afford care. How did we get to this place? We got to this place uh, at least partly um, by, I mean, there, there was legislation which allowed, which uh, sort of created HMOs and said that these could be run for profit, uh, and they thought that business uh, deals and uh, and digitalizing records and all these things uh, would lead to better health care. But what they led to was uh, wealthier and wealthier corporations, who I don't blame because um, you know they were told and I think still believe that their job is to make money and that that will somehow weed out the weaklings and make medical care better. It does exactly the opposite. Who are the quacks? <laughs> there will always be quacks. Um, the the uh, I wish that insurance companies, by monitoring things, uh, could somehow catch and punish quacks. They don't, and they can't. And so, um, there there are have always been doctors who are s selling snake oil and trying to make money off of patients, uh, and they're reprehensible and should be, um, you know, and and should be found and punished. But at, at this point, uh, quacks do quite well because all they have to do is put in the right numbers to the computer, and they'll get the check back from the insurer. How'd you cut off your thumb? <laughs> <laughs> a, a table saw, um, which I found out later is embarrassingly common. Uh, you know, I, um, but uh, I, I had about 20 minutes to get to work, and I said a little time, and I had a branch that had fallen in the backyard that was walnut, and I just wanted to see what it looked like. And uh, I was pushing with uh, a push stick, and the branch caught up anyway. And my left thumb uh, decided to help out without uh, without consulting my brain. And so all of a sudden there was blood everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I went into the kitchen and my wife looked at me and she says, we're going to have to go to the emergency room, aren't we? And I said, yes, dear. <laughs> well, give, give me some more paper towels. Um, so it, 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 it's... Um, you know, I don't know if that's part of bipolar disease, but I do tend to uh, do things not always in the safest way. Did you ever find the end of your thumb that you cut off? <laughs> no, I didn't. It's, I, 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 I think the mice have found it by now and eaten it. But, um, but it, there was this sort of refrain where I, you know, I showed up at the hospital and they said, do you have the, you know, do you have the part of the thumb? I said, no. She, she said, well, your wife should go back and try to find it. And she did, and she couldn't find it. She came back to me. And then when they finally um, actually 
were going to look at me again. It was the same ridiculous, unnecessary waiting. I said, you know, if you are a doctor on staff who has sort of helped this hospital a lot and you have blood all over you and the chief complaint is partial amputation of the left thumb, you would expect a little quicker service. Um, but, um, you know, and then finally they look at me as a guy I knew well. Um, and he was, he was the guy who says, he said, uh, you know, you're going to need a hand surgeon. I said, duh. <laughs> I didn't say duh, but I, um, I said, I thought you had one of those guys here. And they said, no, we refer everything in town. Uh, do you want an ambulance? And I said, no, I know I'll get there quicker if my wife drives. But and, and at every point, he said, oh, do you have the part of the thumb? They might want to sew it back on. And then when you arrived at Beth Israel, I said, do you have it? So there was this refrain of the unfound tip of the thumb. Why are you so complimentary toward uh, Massachusetts General Hospital? Because they gave me an absolutely wonderful training. And, um, um, and, and, you know, they did. They taught me how to be a good doctor. Um, and part of the tragedy is, I think, what they, with the increased overhead, the electronic medical record, which cost $3 billion, and so forth, is they have, you know, I think they are desperately trying to keep, you know, practicing good medicine, but that requires more and more and more money and more and more and more overhead. And I think they have got, you know, they're pushed into competing with other hospitals they used to be friends with. Um, and um, so there's a, you know, unfortunately, medicine in general and with Mass General, um, they've been pushed into into what I think are unfortunate policies, which end up giving, over-treating the well-insured and under-treating the under-insured. How much does malpractice insurance cost you a year? I, I don't know. And that's, and the, the, the it, it sort of, it's, um, you know, there, there are things, we, we have a division of labor. My wife, um, t- you know, watches things and, uh, I, it doesn't tell me what things cost because it's just, it's just not worth it to watch me fume. So, uh, but she, her job is to tell me when we're out of money. And then my job is to try to figure out how we can get more money or spend less. Why is she able to do that and you're not? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's temperament. I mean, uh, I was, you know, I'm the son of a science fiction writer and she's the daughter of a banker. You, you say in your book that without gaming the system, it's hard to stay in business. It, that's absolutely true. Give us an example of what you're talking about. Um, they... Oof, I mean, they'll have these quality measures that say, well, everybody has to have an asthma plan. Asthma costs us too much money. So um, so you, we have to have these stats which make sure your asthma patients are on the right medicines and aren't going to emergency rooms too much. And that sounds all reasonable, but that's all part of what doctors were doing already anyway. So now the patient ends up having to pay for uh, the paperwork and everything on these quality control measures. And the best way for me to make my numbers look good is to get rid of my asthmatics, especially the ones who are, who are poor. So again, there is this subtle pressure, which is essentially not taking care of people with pre-existing conditions. What do you say to people that, um, well, I'll just give you an example. You call your doctor who you've been seeing for 15 or 20 years, and they say, um, we can't get you an appointment with that doctor. You must see a practical nurse or, you know, you, you write about the nurses. Uh, yeah. What do you say to people? I say, you know, the, the, I mean, the thing about NPs is a lot of them are absolutely wonderful clinicians. I, you know, I, I, I trust my son's life to them and, and, and I trust my patients. Um, but the fact is that was done to save money because they'll say, okay, uh, since they're not an MD, 
um, we'll we'll pay you 80% of what we painted a doctor. And again, there's all this paperwork that goes on. Um, but again, people are forced into this by increasing overhead. When I started practice, our overhead was 27%. And now it's creeping between 50 and 60. And you have a lot more freedom when you have 27% overhead rather than 50 or 60. So um, if I don't meet my asthma numbers, which are absolutely meaningless in terms of asthma, um, then I, I can, you know, I can get slapped on the wrist or it can cost me, you know, $20 per patient per month. I mean, there, there are all these little systems that, uh, make, uh, failure to comply expensive and it has nothing to do with the quality of care, even though that's, that's the alleged, uh, rationale. When you were having these four psychotic episodes in your life, are there any things that kind of trigger that they're about to happen? Yes. I mean, I recognize them now. Uh, with the first one, I just, I, I thought I was becoming enlightened. Um, and uh, the second time, uh, I could feel uh, the voices, the increased um, uh, meaning in everything, the inability to sleep or eat. Um, and the, I unwisely decided that smoking a lot of marijuana would maybe help, made everything worse. Um, and the other one was they took me off of lithium because I was having some side effects. And over a few years, I got into the habit of of drinking at least a little bit every day. And I had uh, sleeping problems, so there was sleeping pills. And I sort of uh, drifted into um, what I now recognize is addiction. Uh, and I stopped it all, and that is a famous way to bring on psychotic breaks. It's happened to other people in my family, trying to do a good thing and get sober, and uh, it it brings on, it, it, it can bring on a psychotic break, uh, at least partly because alcohol is a pretty good mood stabilizer until it isn't. I don't know whether it's the time that we're talking or whether it just caught my attention in your book where you said, <laughs> You had a Russian psychiatrist that was less than worthless. <laughs> yes. When was that? And that, my feelings about the Russians have been re- recently vindicated. <laughs> Why was he worthless? Less than worthless? Because he always did the same thing, and he was always clicking on a computer uh, with a social worker who was really quite nice. Um, but he treated we, me with a medication, which just made me feel awful and didn't help at all with the mental, um, uh, with the symptoms I was having. And I told him this, and he just, uh, he, he, he doubled the dose. Again, doctors can get away with just very glib, non-helpful um, answers like they did with my friend with the kidney dose. Well, oh, let's just double the steroids. Well, let's just double the atypical antipsychotic and um so and he was he tried to um i had i was having back issues i actually uh slipped a disc and stuff and they thought that was um psychological my wife went out and bought a, a mattress and and they said oh no this isn't regulation or whatever you can't have the mattress and um and so I told him that I was in pain, and uh, and generally when my patients had a symptom, I tried to uh, help them with it. And I, you know, um, I said, well, I don't know. In Russia, do you have something like the Hippocratic Oath, or you just uh, just wing it and hope for the best? <laughs> so that was. <laughs> I at least got off a good line. Last couple of questions. One is, uh, are you glad you were named after Mark Twain? Yes, but I'm glad that you didn't include the twain. <laughs> what? When did you discover why you were named Mark, and and um, did you follow up by studying him at any point? I, you know, he, I have, you know, he's one of the authors I'll reread, and I'll be astounded at things that I find in Huck Finn or. Um, it, it, I, it's so it's always worth reading him again. There are other authors like that, uh, with Tolstoy and 
and Dickens, you know, they're, they're, um, but I don't think it was because, I, I mean, the things that he and I share, which I love, he was, he couldn't spell very well. I am a horrendous speller. And he said that it shouldn't be held against a man if he knew more than one way to spell a word. So, One of the things I noticed in your other interviews, and then maybe it's just me, but I, it, it, it looks like that people hesitate uh, who are interviewing you to ask about your father. Yeah. Why is that, do you think? And, and what's your reaction? Do you ever, have, you ever get tired of talking about your father? Um, I, see, I did not, they assume that I grew up in the shadow, um, uh, of a wonderful, a famous writer and a cultural icon, and I must have some sort of trauma from that or whatever. And I grew up, uh, you know, uh, with a guy who couldn't get a job teaching English at Cape Cod Community College, was, was a terrible car salesman, um, was fired by, uh, Sports Illustrated after one day. So, I mean, it was not much of a shadow. Um, and, uh, it just, it, you know, I think it was harder for my sisters and younger people in the family to grow up with, um, some, you know, somebody who was worshiped by other people. I, it just, it, it, it never, struck me that way. I thought the amount of money he was getting paid was destructive. I think he would have agreed with that on some level. So, but I did not feel um, intimidated. There, there was an interview, which I really liked. And before, um, before we went on, he very kindly was like, you know, touching my shoulder and said, is there anything you would, would rather not talk about? And I said, well, if we could just not talk about my father or mental illness, I would like that. The guy really, really turned several colors of, of green. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I said, no, no, I, said, I promise. I was just kidding. <laughs> Last question. Have you ever been to the Vonnegut Museum named after your father in Indianapolis? I have. And I... Uh, I uh, I have lent them things like my father's Purple Heart, um, a Nazi sword he brought back from the war, and um, and I participate sometimes in their band book uh, festivals. Um, so uh, and they're in a completely different place now. It was really just a uh, a storefront operation the last time I was there. I think they're actually in pretty good quarters now. Dr. Mark Vonnegut, author of three books, and the latest is called The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thanks for listening. Q&A will be back on this feed on June 5th with Marine Corps veteran turned National Book Award winner Phil Clay, author of Uncertain Ground.